Yes, in the brief, in the brief time remaining, um, I'm, not, I'm not going to talk about any viruses that are only 24 um, nucleotides in length, but um, I am going to talk quite generally about viruses. Um, Arnie gave me the topic of viruses overview. So when you get that sort of topic, you figure, well, this is great because I can decide to talk about anything I want. And so that's, that's what I did. And um, I have one disclaimer at the start, and that is that I'm the founder of a small biotech company that is developing a certain type of antiviral drug. And I'm going to talk about antiviral drugs and why I think perhaps this company's approach, which comes from my lab at Princeton, might be a good approach. And you should, of course, take all of that with a grain of salt. Um, but anything else that I tell you, you can probably believe. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious, so here you see um, a graph of, of life expectancy um, in the United States, and you see um, in 1900, um, women who we'll focus on here, um, um, just under 50 years was your life expectancy, and today um, it's just over 80, um, and um, a huge part of that increase in life expectancy um, is controlling, um, to the extent that we can do it now, infectious disease, and um, what is responsible for this dramatic dip in life expectancy um, just before 1920? Spanish right, the Spanish flu. Why is it called the Spanish flu? <laughs> well, um, that's, that's an interesting historical um, story because people today think that the um, Spanish flu actually came from the US, from the Midwest, um, traveled to Europe on the troop ships during the First World War. And um, um, after it got to Europe, it wasn't reported um, in the presses in um, the UK or in Germany um, because you didn't report things that would discourage the population. Um, but Spain, when it got to Spain, of course, was neutral. And so the press reported it, so everybody assumed that that's where it started. Um, but it probably came from us. There's a great book called The Great Influenza that a fellow named John Barry um, wrote. Um, it's, it's just a wonderful book. So if you want to learn about the 1918 um, flu epidemic, um, which you can see had a huge effect on life expectancy in 1918 and 1919, um, you can read that book. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? Um, well, I'm going to begin with um, what's a virus. And we'll start by looking very briefly at a virus you've certainly heard of, um, which is smallpox. And then we'll step back and talk about the defining features of viruses and um, think a bit about how they can cause disease. Um, my view of viruses is predominantly shaped by disease-causing viruses. These are the viruses that have been most extensively studied. Um, but um, many, many viruses, perhaps the vast majority of them, um, might not cause disease. Um, and um, they, they might actually, in some cases, be beneficial. Um, then I'd like to talk about um, Tony Fauci's concept of the, perf the um, perpetual challenge. And I'll tell you who Tony is um, in a few minutes. And um, this is the emergence and reemergence of, of new infectious agents. And um, since it's been in the news so much, I thought we could use Ebola um, as a case study of a, an emerging and reemerging um, virus that teaches us quite a bit about viruses when you, when you um, look and see what's been going on there. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit about therapeutic solutions um, to um, um, viruses that cause disease and um, then ask the question, um, can infection by a virus ever be beneficial? Okay, can it ever work to our advantage? And then I'm going to end um, because um, I'm just going to lay out a few things that came to my mind with what I see as some of the big inter interesting problems in virology. And I'm hoping um, that you're really going to chime in um, and add quite a bit um, to that list at, at the end of our talk today. Um, please don't hesitate um, to interrupt me with questions. Um, I probably won't be able to answer them, but I'll give it a try. And comments are always welcome. That makes it much more fun, I think, for everybody. Okay. Um, smallpox. So um, I, again, this is a virus that we've all heard of. Um, back um, when it was still with us, 
um, it would cause pandemics with um, greater than 20% mortality. Okay, so that's a very serious mortality rate. Um, the virus that causes smallpox, its official name is the variola virus. And um, it was first controlled um, many hundreds of years ago um, in Asia. Um, there is some disagreement as to whether it was first controlled in um, China or in India um, by a process called variolation. And um, this is a very interesting process because what we would do is, um, remember um, 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 smallpox causes these lesions, these pus-filled lesions. And so you would either take a pus-filled lesion and grind it up, or even the dried scabs towards the end of the disease and grind them up. And they would be full then of this variola virus. And then what folks would do was they would scrape that into the skin of people that they wanted to protect from infection um, by variola virus. And it's interesting, um, variolation um, turns out um, to have a mortality of only about 1%. Um, but if you waited to get infected with the virus, your, your chances were, were much, much less. And so it was quite widely used. Um, and then, of course, um, Jenner um, advanced on that concept. Um, and he was, of course, the product of a lot of people thinking about this. But his process then was vaccination. Um, because what he realized um, was that the pox virus that infected cows um, might well protect against um, variola virus. And so he took um, the pus-filled um, lesions from cows infected with cowpox, ground them up, um, scraped them into people's arms, and, and famously one of those people was a very young boy, 11 years old, um, and then challenged them by variolation after the vaccination had taken. And um, fortunately for the boy, um, he, he was c completely protected then um, from um, the variolation. So now we had... <laughs> yes, it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, fare well at all with an IRB today. In fact, I'm sure you could land in jail for that one. <laughs> he did, yes. But that wasn't vaccination, that was variolation. Well, that, that's a good question, and I, 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 I don't know. But I, I think I, there must have been a quantitative sense of how it affected your odds. And of course, if you were a ro robust young adult, um, your chances were always better than the elderly and, and young children. OK. So um, the last case um, in the US was reported in 1949, thanks to vaccination. And um, vaccination was discontinued in the US um, after um, 72. And so um, most of you guys, I'm sure all of you guys, um, never saw um, a, a um, vac vaccination with smallpox. And then really um, interesting and very cool is that the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, instituted an eradication campaign in 1967. And the concept here was um, maybe we can clear the planet Earth of this virus. And one of the reasons that you could think about doing this is that there's no animal reservoir um, for smallpox. It only infects people. Okay, so that was huge. Um, because if there's an animal reservoir, it's a whole different scale problem. Um, and the other thing was you can easily recognize someone who's infected, right? Because you, you get these pus-filled lesions um, all over you. And so you could recognize these people um, who were infected. And then um, there was a campaign where you would vaccinate everyone who came in contact um, with those people with the lesions and everyone who came in contact with their direct con contacts. And so that was a ring of people, right, of contacts. And so that, that's known as ring vaccination. And it worked. And um, the disease was declared eradicated in 1918, 1980. Um, and of course, um, nothing ever has a completely um, happy solved ending because today,
um, we think a lot about um, could um, smallpox be resurrected um, for bioterrorism, okay? It's conceivable because the sequence is known and um, it's no big deal um, to regenerate the virus if you have to know what you're doing. So um, the U that's right. And so the U.S. now has a store of, of smallpox vaccine that was made more recently um, in cell culture. Okay, so, so that's one virus and, and it starts us thinking about, you know, how do you protect ourselves against the virus? And so let's think about some of the features of viruses um, generally. Um, first of all, um, they are everywhere, okay? So viruses infect animals, fish, plants, insects, everything. And um, very importantly, viral infections can cross species barriers, okay? Not all of them, um, but many of them. And so these are called zoonotic infections, and we're gonna see that when we talk about Ebola um, in a few minutes. And we encounter many millions of, of viruses every day. Um, when we breathe, we breathe in viruses. When we eat, we eat them. When we touch surfaces, um, we pick up viruses from the surface, and then of course we um, rub our eyes and put our fingers in our mouth and again um, eat and um, live with the viruses. Um, do you like the beach? Um, I find this an amazing number. Every milliliter of seawater contains about 100 million virus particles. Can you believe that? 100 million virus particles? Um, think about that the next time you get some seawater in your mouth. Um, nearly 200,000 um, DNA virus populations. And so these virus populations are defined as viruses um, that share 95% or greater sequence identity. So 200,000 DNA virus populations have so far um, been um, identified um, from samples of, 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 of marine environments. And that's only DNA viruses. They completely ignored the RNA viruses, which may be even more abundant than the DNA viruses. Um, endogenous retroviruses, I'm sure you're going to hear about these from Steve Goff later today, um, HERVs, they comprise five to eight percent of our genome, and through evolution, they've had tremendous impact on our, our genome. And then many different viruses are present in normal and diseased human tissue. I find it very intriguing that um, one of the things that um, people have been interested in doing recently um, is using um, um, sequencing or these arrays that can detect all sorts of different viruses and then ask what viruses might be present in samples from tumors. And tumors are loaded with different viruses, most of which I don't even know what they are. I've never heard of them. And so I think there's an awful lot to learn about what these viruses might be doing um, to influence um, the behavior of a specific cancer or maybe they just like to grow there because it, 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 it would be an immuno-privileged site from the virus's point of view. So maybe they're, they're not contributing anything, but who knows? And viruses ain't the only thing there. Um, 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 these tissues are also full of all sorts of microbes. And you know, I used to think um, that inside my skin, everything was pretty much sterile, you know, until you got to my intestines, but that's not the case. Um, you can find viruses um, in all sorts of different places um, inside of us. So um, one of the interesting things about viruses is that they're incredibly diverse, incredibly diverse. So um, here's the pox virus, okay? I, I was talking about smallpox. And um, this is physically the largest virus particle that's known to infect people. Um, it's about um, 350 nanometers by 250 nanometers in diameter. Um, herpes viruses, this is, this is what I work on in my laboratory, and the particular herpes virus that I work on um, is called <coughs> cytomegalovirus. You're gonna hear something about that a, a little bit later, and it's about 200 um, nanometers in diameter. Um, and um, pox viruses and herpes viruses contain double-stranded DNA. Um, here's parvoviruses here, um, and um, you can see that that's a very small virus particle. And unlike the pox viruses and the herpes viruses, it doesn't contain this outer, so this outer envelope, which is a lipid-containing membrane. And um, parvoviruses, 
um, contain a genome of single-stranded DNA, okay? Not double-stranded, um, but single-stranded DNA. Um, it's not on here, but Popova viruses um, include the virus that Arnie Levine was studying um, when he discovered P53. That was 1879, 1979, yes. Um, <laughs> okay, so these are DNA viruses. And then if you look at RNA viruses, you see the diversity continues. Um, here's influenza virus. And so it contains um, single-stranded RNA again, but it's chopped up, not chopped up, but it's present in eight different pieces. And each piece then uh, um, encodes for one or two proteins. Um, rotavirus contains double-stranded RNA, and it's present in 11 pieces, each of which is known to encode one protein. Uh, rotavirus is a, causes respiratory disease in young children. It's, um, I, I, I'm sorry, um, it, it causes diarrhea in young children, and it's a, a very dangerous infection. Unfortunately, we have a, a, a good, effective vaccine for it, um, at least in the Western world at this point. Um, polio virus is, is a very, very well studied. It has a single-stranded um, plus-strand plus RNA, um, and um, it makes a long single protein from that RNA. We call it a polyprotein. And then that's chopped up into, into different pieces um, to make the different proteins that do things. And then thinking about um, the more trendy viruses from the news, here's Ebola. It's a member of a family of viruses called phyloviruses. In general, you don't want to go anywhere near a phylovirus. And um, it contains a um, single-stranded RNA that is the negative sense. The negative sense RNA means it doesn't code directly for proteins. You have to copy it to make a positive sense RNA that would encode for proteins. And here's Zika virus, which is a flavivirus. So it's a, a close relative of dengue, if you've heard of dengue virus. And it has an RNA um, that is a um, single-stranded plus sense RNA. And then here's a virus of bacteria, a very elegant virus. You can see um, we have a head here. And inside the shell of this head is the double-stranded DNA of the bacteriophage. And then you have this contractile sheath um, that allows it to inject the DNA um, into um, its victim, a bacterial cell, um, a very elegant-looking virus. So um, if you just look at viruses and think about their nucleic acids, um, being a virus has been solved in many different ways. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So that's, that's a very stable structure, okay? And one of the, the critical um, features that um, these capsids, which have this shape, bring to the virus is stability. And it has to be stable not only um, as it enters the cell and it's disassembled, but it has to be um, stable in a harsh outer environment, right? So I think it's been a good way to solve stability. First of all, the, 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 this shape that Buckman Coppola put together for his geodesic dome, and, and it is extremely stable, as, as Tom said, it, it will resist environmental breakdown. But even more important, if you think about it, it has a, it has a symmetry. It, uh, it's all triangular faces, right? And um, it's made up of subunits, which are symmetrical. So it's self-assembled mm -hmm. very efficiently. So the, the symmetries that you see in the, each of these viruses are really to allow a self-assembly mechanism which doesn't rely too heavily. Some, some viruses do rely on other proteins to assemble, but doesn't rely too heavily on uh, assembly processes. If you make enough of the protein, then they just crystallize around the DNA. Mm. You don't see on the in viruses the structure? Oh, no, no, no. You see it in cells all the time. Mm. The microtubule are a good example of that. So, so hepatitis B virus, um, that has this type of a shell, and people make the vaccine for that by simply expressing it in yeast cells in the absence of any other viral proteins, and it self-assembles in the yeast cell. And that self-assembled structure then is what is used as the vaccine. Okay.
So another defining feature of viruses, I think it's an obvious one, is that um, outside of a cell, um, they're a package of information that is, we could say, inert. Um, and viruses replicate within cells um, where they subvert the cellular machinery um, to suit their needs. And actually, this, this um, statement is a very interesting one because one of the big pieces to the field of experimental virology um, is to understand how cellular genes influence the replication, spread, and pathogenesis of viral infections. And um, it's a very, very complicated area. Um, because if you take a virus like mine, cytomegalovirus, um, and you do RNA-seq and look just at the levels of RNAs, my god, almost every RNA in the cell changes in its levels. Um, people have done screens um, for um, SI RNAs that reduce the level of individual gene products in cells and ask, well, how many of them influence cytomegalovirus? And the answer is thousands. Okay. So this is enormously complex. And of course, a lot of things that influence the growth of the virus might be very indirect. Um, but this is something that people are working very hard to try to understand. And it's, it's kind of slow going um, when you get down to a specific gene and you want to understand how that specific gene influences the virus, maybe by inhibiting its replication or maybe by supporting its replication. So if you look at this um, um, diagram, I, I think it's something that you're probably all um, generally familiar with. Um, so a virus um, will interact um, with a um, host cell at the cellular surface. So one of the viral proteins um, will know how to interact with one or more proteins on the surface of the cell. And then um, the, the virus can either enter the cell um, via membrane fusion, okay, if it's an enveloped virus at, at the plasma membrane, or it can be endocytosed and brought into the cell and then released inside of the cell. Um, and um, then in this case where we've got a DNA virus, um, it gets transcribed to make RNAs and proteins, replicated to make many more copies of the viral genome, and then you assemble the virus particles, and um, they can exit from the host cell, okay, and go and find a new cell um, to infect. Uh, many viruses um, that infect us and cause disease in us um, spread from cell to cell um, without ever leaving the protective environment of a cell. They, they spread directly from cell to cell. And so that's a big part of how the virus I work on um, spreads in us. And, and leaving a cell and becoming a free-floating virus probably isn't too important um, to some viruses. Another defining feature is that viruses are small. Okay. So here's my virus. It's one of the large, it's in fact, it's other than the pox viruses, it's the largest um, DNA virus known to infect people at 200 nanometers. HIV is 100 nanometers, hepatitis B virus, 40, um, yellow fever virus, 50, and AAV, a very small one, is 22 nanometers. And um, yellow fever virus um, here is interesting um, because um, this goes back to a fellow named Jesse Lazier. Um, who wrote to his wife from Cuba in 1900 where he was studying what we now know as yellow fever virus. He says to his wife, I think I'm on the track of the real germ, quote, unquote. And in 1902, he injected himself with a filtered serum um, from a yellow fever virus patient, and he died. And so he proved that yellow fever is caused by a filterable agent, a filterable agent. And so Filterable agent, historically, was a very important way of defining a virus. Um, a, a fellow named Dmitry Ivanovsky in the late 1800s um, was studying um, tobacco mosaic disease. And he discovered that unlike diseases caused by bacteria, um, the agent that caused tobacco mosaic disease could pass through filters that would block the passage of bacterial cells. And so he knew it was something very small. Um, it became known as a filterable agent, and so now we know yellow fever was caused by something very small, a filterable agent. And um, so this was the first human disease shown to be caused by a filterable agent, so thank you, Jesse. And um, Walter Reed then discovered that yellow fever is, is spread by mosquitoes. 
Um, and this whole family of viruses, um, flaviviruses, are, are um, mosquito-borne viruses. They can replicate in the gut of mosquitoes, and then when they infect us, they can replicate and cause disease. And yellow fever is related to dengue and, and Zika that I've mentioned before. Okay, so viruses are small. Small, you know, is a great way to spread. Um, influenza takes great advantage of this. Okay, so small particles can be easily aerosolized. Um, sneezing produces aerosols, but so does just plain old breathing producing aerosols. And um, people actually go and look at this sort of thing. And it was reported last year that um, 10 to the fourth influenza virus particles are exhaled during 30 minutes of normal breathing by a person who's infected with influenza virus and infectious. Okay, they, they can spread the virus. Okay. So um, that's a, a, a lot of virus particles just by normal breathing. And there's more good news to this, and that is that um, droplets um, less than 10 microns in diameter, and so that's um, the majority of the droplets um, when you sneeze or you cough or you breathe, um, they readily reach into our lower respiratory tract. And a virus like flu loves that because that's where it wants to find its home and infect. Another feature, very large populations. And this is a really big and really important one. And um, this table just shows you um, the number of virus particles that you can recover in the laboratory by infecting various different types of cells. And so you can see that influenza, depending on the cell type, can make anywhere from 500 particles to 10,000 particles um, per cell, okay? And the champion, um, at least in the, of those viruses that have been looked at carefully now, um, is a virus called SIV, um, which is an important um, uh, model for HIV. And it can um, produce 400 to six, 40 to 60,000 particles per cell. So that's a lot of virus particles when you consider that a normal infection um, will result in many different cells being infected, right? And so all of these many different cells are producing virus. And so you have very large populations. And it's interesting, when you look at these large populations and examine them carefully, you find that they're full of variants or mutants. And so people often refer to the population of influenza in an infected person as a quasi-species to point out that um, there's many, many different variants. And one of the sources of these many different variants is that in the case of flu, the polymerase that duplicates its RNA to make progeny RNA can't correct errors. Okay, so unlike our DNA polymerases, which have error correcting um, capabilities, flu doesn't bother to do that. And so it makes these huge populations that are full of all sorts of different variants. Um, and this is typical um, across many different viruses. And interestingly, the virus I work on um, has a DNA um, polymerase that has um, 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 the ability um, to correct mistakes, okay? Um, but even that virus comes pretty close to flu in terms of the vast number of variants that are produced in an individual person upon inf infection. And then, of course, there's an advantage to the viral population from this, and that is that the variants are selected for fitness, okay? And so um, there can be environmental selections, um, immune selections, drugs, okay? One of the problems with flu um, is that if you treat someone um, with the standard of care, um, which is co called azoltamivir, who has a flu infection, treat them with azoltamivir. Um, by the time they're recovered, if you look at the virus that they're producing at the end of their disease, um, it's full of resistant virus one passage, okay? And so um, that's a big problem as you select these variants for fitness when you try to treat viral diseases. Um, and anyway, it's obvious, ill-adapted variants drop out of the population and advantaged variants, like a drug-resistant variant, if you're treating with a drug, takes over. Okay, another thing is that viruses can cause acute 
or long-term infections. Um, so um, viruses that are, I think, famous for causing acute infections are influenza A, um, rhinoviruses, so the cold virus, rhinovirus, um, rotavirus, I told you, diarrhea. All of these cause acute infections. Um, the virus infects, replicates, spreads, and then it's cleared, okay, by our immune system. Um, cytomegalovirus, um, which is a herpes virus, provides an example of both. Um, when you're first infected with cytomegalovirus, um, the infection lasts for weeks, okay, weeks, and um, you infect many different cell types and organs. Um, then you enter into a phase called the persistent phase, which can last for years. And now the virus can only be found in three places, in epithelial cells in the salivary gland, the mammary gland, um, and the kidney. And this is how the virus makes its way so effectively in the world, because it ends up then in saliva, breast milk, and urine. Okay, great way to spread from per person to person. And then um, there's a third phase, a, le a, a latent phase that lasts a lifetime. And um, the virus um, infects um, a certain class of cells in the bone marrow, shuts itself down, mostly not completely, and um, is um, able then to persist. And the problem is it can reactivate and cause disease um, at, an, at another time in the future. And also this latent virus isn't susceptible to any of the drugs we have today. Okay, so um, that's a big problem. Okay. So um, acute or long-term infections. So how do they cause disease? Well, um, one thing they can do um, is induce a toxic immune response. And so influenza um, can induce a cytokine storm. And that was the big problem, um, we believe, with the 1918 flu, um, which not only killed very young people and very old people, as is typical for flu, um, but it killed people your age very rapidly um, because it induced this monstrous toxic cytokine storm um, and you would drown then from um, the response in your lungs. Um, you can also kill critical host cells. So HIV kills CD um, four positive T cells. And I'm not going to go into that because um, Steve Goff, I'm sure, will tell us about that. And um, finally, um, you, my third example here is you can produce a toxin. And so rotavirus um, produces a gene product called NSP4, non-structural protein 4, um, that deranges ion transport and induces diarrhea. A great way to spread, right? Um, induce diarrhea and travel with it. And so um, viruses can also cause um, chronic disease. And um, one example of chronic disease is cancer. And we know very well that human papillomavirus, um, certain types of it can cause cervical cancer. We have lots of evidence for it, uh, which culminates in the fact that um, the vaccine to human papillomavirus, for example, Gardasil, um, that protects against the development of cervical dysplasia, which leads then to cancer, okay? And so um, we have lots of evidence that this virus can induce cancer, and we know a lot about how it does it, but I'm not going to talk about that. And um, there are also uncertain but intriguing, okay? That means um, a lot of fun to think about, but you have to be pretty critical about this. Um, but there's possible roles in chronic disease for other viruses, um, like a role for herpes viruses in Alzheimer's disease. So there's certain herpes viruses that if you look in people with Alzheimer's disease, look in their brains, um, you find um, that they are present um, at higher levels than you find in healthy brains. And you know, one of the um, products that is a signature consequence of Alzheimer's disease is the accumulation of this A-beta peptide. And people have shown you can take that A-beta peptide and add it to various herpes viruses, and it neutralizes them. It prevents them in, from infecting cells. And so some people are thinking that, gee, maybe, just maybe, um, this A-beta peptide, um, its real job is as an initial defense, maybe a very primitive initial defense, against a viral infection in the brain. And so, you know, maybe it'll turn out that there's something here. Um, there's certainly lots of smoke, and it's intriguing um, to follow it. 
Okay, now I'd like to talk about um, the perpetual challenge. And um, this um, is uh, a concept that um, Tony Fauci brought up, and he likes to talk about it. Yeah. Well, of course, um, herpes simplex, which is the one you're referring to, um, can spread um, when you have these sores. Mm -hmm. But of course, you can be infected with herpes simplex when you don't have these sores, which result from reactivation of the virus, but you're still infected. Um, you're just not infectious at that point. And cytomegalovirus, um, when it's producing virus in your saliva, and then you can infect someone by kissing them, um, you don't have any um, pathological consequences of that. You don't know you're infected. Okay, so um, some, uh, cytomegalovirus can infect, produce progeny, and spread, and you don't even know you're infected. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting point you bring up. The virus doesn't always have to be making you sick to be able to spread. Okay, um, so um, Tony Fauci um, is the director of, of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, and he's an amazing, amazing um, scientific leader and an amazing scientist. And one of the things he likes to talk about, and this keeps getting updated, um, this is the one from his original paper on it, is the fact that um, we um, humans face this perpetual challenge of infectious disease, and you never know what's coming next. Okay, you never know what's coming next. And so he points out here that um, SARS is a disease that um, um, emerged in 2003 in Asia. Of course, you know it spread to North America. And so that's listed here as a newly emerging um, infection in, in this version of the slide. Uh, variants of influenza, which are potentially very dangerous because if you're infected by them, um, the um, mortality is very high. But fortunately, they don't spread well um, between people yet. And so that's an emerging, newly emerging virus. The most recent one is H7N9. Um, then um, um, we have re-emerging viruses. And so you see dengue um, showing up in the southern United States, OK? Dengue was here. Um, it was a big, big problem in places like Philadelphia in, in revolutionary times. And um, now it's, it's reappearing. Um, in North America. And of course, we have deliberately emerging, which is the really sad case. And the example here is anthrax bioterrorism. Do you know where those letters were mailed that had the anthrax in them? <laughs> right. Right here in Princeton. Um, I, I had followed Arnie as the chair of the molecular biology department um, by the time that happened. and. I, I was first visited by Princeton police officers. Um, then I, it turns out Princeton has a detective. And so the Princeton detective came. Um, um, and then it got more serious. Um, I, I got visited by the FBI, which was kind of freaky. And of course, they all thought that it must be somebody at the university. And I kept saying, go and talk to people at the institute. That, and, but um, <laughs> looks like we were clean. OK. so. Um, I'd like to focus in then on um, the Ebola virus um, as, as someone that will take a bit deeper dive on, um, which is part of this problem. It's a re-emerging virus, and I love this cartoon um, because if you remember, um, when Ebola got to the United States, one infected man initially, right, um, we freaked out, okay? And so this cartoon is pointing out all the other things that we don't worry about that kill so many people. And if we want to think about infectious disease, seasonal flu kills 25 to 30,000 people in the United States every year. Okay. And so um, what happened with Ebola here, um, we have to really step back and, and exercise um, some perspective. But of course, in Africa, um, it was a disaster. And so um, Ebola as well as another virus you might have heard of, Marburg virus. These are, are phyloviruses. 
And the first documented human infection was in Marburg, Germany, um, ergo the name of the virus. And this was a lab infection from monkeys that were imported from Africa, okay? And so um, if you look over here, um, we're looking at Ebola outbreaks um, from 1976 to 2018. And of course, here's the West Africa um, outbreak, which was the, by far the largest outbreak. Um, but we have a, an, an outbreak today ongoing um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the New York Times just reported two days ago that the number of, inf of infected people who have died in that outbreak has reached 1,632. And of course, those are the people who have been counted. And that's a particularly sad and complex um, outbreak problem because it's in the middle of an area that is very unsettled and there's warring factions going on. And so it's, it's been very, very difficult um, to treat people. But let's think about the West Africa outbreak. And so um, here you can see the three countries that were involved. And there were a total of, of 28,600 reported cases and 11,315 deaths. And so that gives you a case fatality rate of about 40%. That's astronomical, okay, for a, a, a viral disease. It's very, very high. And um, this is a zoonotic disease, okay? It's a disease that we believe lives in bats, and it can spread from bats um, to other primates and, and these deer-like animals in the forest. And then it can spread to humans that might um, 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 kill these animals um, for meat or come in contact with ex excrement for the bat from the bats that are full of the virus. Okay, so it's a zoonotic infection. And so it's an infection that resides in bats. It apparently doesn't kill the bats. It doesn't make them sick, but it gets into people and there's a big problem. Um, that's an interesting question that was raised because there's a variant that I'm going to tell you about um, that was better able to infect people um, than, um, than the variant that comes out of the bats. And people argued about whether that would get back to bats, but it turns out that that doesn't seem to have any growth advantage or any spread advantage in bats. So um, the idea is that there's probably not a significant a flow back to bats that, that matters? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Okay, um, Ebola pathogenesis and spread. So it's spread via direct contact with inflect, infected fluids. The incubation period, so this is the period between the time you're infected and the time you have symptoms and you're infectious. It ranges in different people from two to 21 days. Um, and Fortunately, infected people aren't contagious until they become symptomatic, until they become symptomatic. So um, the R0 um, for um, Ebola virus is 1.5 to 2. Do you guys know what R0 is? Probably. The basic reproduction ratio. Right, right. And so this is a number that tells you if you take one infectious person and put them in a population of naive, susceptible to people, people, how many of them are you going to infect, right? And so um, this is 1.5 to 2 for Ebola. Um, the 1918 flu, um, which is a bit high for flu in general, um, is thought to have been about 2 to 3. Uh, measles is the champion um, in terms of spreading at 12 to 18. And so it's R0 is not um, spectacular. Um, the molecular basis for disease, well, one of the most interesting things here, it initially replicates and then kills macrophages and dendritic cells. And these are our frontline defenses against infections. Okay, so it's, it's a big problem that this virus is very effective at killing off these cells and it cripples then our immune response to the virus right from the start, okay? And so, um, the, the rest, I think, is details. And, um, you know, virologists always like to take a picture of a cell and map out what happens when the virus enters the cell. Yeah? So I guess for a virus with such high mortality, I mean, do corpses themselves, like, is there effort? The corpses? 
Oh yes, that 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 is a big problem. Um, yeah, you you you're you're right on. So one of the big problems is that um, in um, West African society, um, to properly respect and prepare um, the dead for um, burial, you very carefully wash them and prepare them for burial, and that. Um, turned out to be a way that the virus was spreading and it was a very difficult spread mechanism to break because then you're telling people not to properly respect um, the dead. <coughs> so this is the Ebola virus replication cycle and I'm not going to spend time going through it but I'm going to just mention two things that I think are especially intriguing. Um, one, you need to know it for um, what I want to talk about next. But when the virus enters the cell, um, it ends up in an early endosome, so a vacuole inside of the cell. And then it has to physically bind to a protein called MPC1 to leave the endosome and get out into the cytoplasm where it can begin to express its genetic information. Um, the, so remember NPC1, because we're going to talk about it. And the other thing that we're not going to really talk about, but I find very intriguing, is this soluble glycoprotein that the virus makes. And so the virus has a glycoprotein that we're going to talk about because we um, have used that in a vaccine for the virus. But it makes a huge amount of this soluble glycoprotein, which is a fragment of the full glycoprotein protein. And um, it has turned out to have many functions. Um, one is um, that it appears to just be a decoy for antibodies, okay? Because if you take convalescent serum that has antibodies to the virus and add this glycoprotein to it, you, you block the ability of that convalescent serum um, to neutralize the virus. And so um, that's the replication cycle. And the reason I wanted you to remember um, that one protein um, is, is um, this um, paper. It's actually two papers that came to the same conclusion. And that is that Ebola, after it left the bats and got into the human population, um, very rapidly adapted in this epidemic. And um, the Ebola glycoprotein um, accumulated a mutant um, where um, alanine 82 um, was changed to a valine. So a very conservative change. And it arose early and dominated the epidemic. And so here you can see in the blue, that's the original genotype of the virus that came out of bats. And then the orange here um, is the variant. And you can see that um, by the, as the epidemic progressed, that became the dominant um, variant um, that you could find um, in, in virus populations. And so um, why did I ask you to remember um, this protein um, NPC1? Well, remember, I, I mentioned that the glycoprotein has to interact with NPC1 to move from endosomes to the cytoplasm. And it turns out that this mutation um, um, in the viral glycoprotein um, interacts within this region, so-called loop 2, of NPC1. And when that change occurs, um, the glycoprotein can interact more efficiently with greater affinity um, with um, the NPC1 from primates than the virus that comes out of bats. And so here you can see the, um, the new variant and you can see enhanced infectivity um, for primates and human cells, okay? And no advantage if you look at rodents or in other figures in the paper if you look at, at bats bat cells. So, um, so that's interesting. So a virus can, ar can um, a zoonotic virus can arise, enter the human population, and then adapt to humans. Okay. So Ebola did that. Another <coughs> very important thing is that um, it turns out that Ebola can persist. Now, you, you wouldn't immediately think of that because it's such a pathological virus, right? It causes such um, um, horrible symptoms. Um, but it turns out it can persist. And one place that it's been found to persist is in semen. And of course, this is very important because it can spread then, right? 
And so um, here's a QRT-PCR experiment. So um, we're looking for the RNA um, of, of Ebola virus um, that is resistant to ribonuclease treatment, okay, which means it's inside of a particle. Okay. And if you do that and look at um, um, patients months after their onset, um, you can see that um, Ebola virus RNA was detected in this particular study out to nine months after the uh, initial um, appearance of symptoms in the men in the study. And another study reported that 58% of these RNA plus samples um, contain infectious virus. Okay. Um, no one's actually brought up PCR as a uh, technique. Maybe it would be if you were blind to take a minute or two to yeah, so, um, talk about it. PCR is a, a very widely used um, technology, um, both in the research laboratory and in diagnostic laboratories. And um, the concept is really pretty straightforward. Um, if you have a specific target DNA, or it can be a target RNA, okay, um, what you do is you make primers that can base pair with the two strands of the DNA, let's just say DNA. Um, you base pair with um, the two strands of the DNA, and then you use um, DNA polymerase to extend the primers essentially in both directions, right? Because you're on either side of a segment of DNA that you would like to amplify. And so after one cycle of doing that, um, you've made a second copy, but only of the region between the primers that you want to amplify. And then PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And so what you do is um, you do one cycle, and this, of course, is at a temperature where the polymerase can function and it's perfectly happy. Then you heat it up, and that separates the strands of the DNA that you've made. Um, you re-anneal with more primers, and then you perform the reaction again. Okay, you, you lower the temperature and perform the reaction again. And so, um, each time you do the reaction, um, you double the number of copies of the DNA between the two primers. And if you do the reaction many times, of course, you can produce huge quantities of a very specific DNA, the DNA sequence between the two primers that you selected. And so in, the, in this case, um, they made primers that corresponded to a specific region on the um, genome of Ebola virus. And um, you say, well, the genome is RNA. So then the first step in this experiment was to convert the RNA to double-stranded DNA um, using another enzyme, reverse transcriptase, which can do that. So PCR is um, used very extensively in molecular biology laboratories. And it's also used in diagnostic laboratories. It's a, it's a very important tool. OK. So, um, there's a case of documented transmission um, from semen um, to a woman. So um, this was at 199 days after the onset of the man's symptoms. And um, the virus in the semen matched the sequence of the virus from the infected woman, which proved that they had to be very closely related because the virus mutates so rapidly, um, it would otherwise look quite different. Um, testes are an immune privilege, privilege site, um, and this is due in part to Sertoli cells. This is another whole topic, so um, I don't propose to spend time on it. Um, but um, it makes sense that the virus would pick this site as well as another immune privilege site, the eye, um, to um, maintain a longer term persistent infection. Yeah. How long do the symptoms of Ebola last after onset? So it takes um, one to 21 days and then about another week and you're either recovering or you're dead. Two to 21 days, another week, and then you're recovering or you're dead. And so the consequence of, of this persistence then, um, which nobody anticipated un until um, people described this, um, the WHO, the World Health Organization, recommends that monitor um, recovered people, recovered men, um, by QRT-PCR.
um, without monitoring, um, um, then you should have no unprotected sex for a year, okay? But I think it, it's really important to monitor if, if that's possible. Who gets the Ebola? The, the, uh, the embryos? The newborn? The, the, the mother? Um, in, in this case, remember, it's, a, it's an acute disease. And so you don't, the pregnancy doesn't have to be involved. If you, if, if you have sex um, and you're, you're, you're susceptible to the Ebola, then you can um, present with the disease. Okay, then um, we got really lucky in this epidemic, if you can see a bright side to this, this terrible epidemic, and that is that we do have a vaccine, okay? And um, this vaccine is made in a virus called VSV, that's vesicular stomatitis virus. Um, it's a virus that um, normally causes um, um, ulcers in, in the mouth and the throat of cattle and horses and pigs. Um, generally doesn't kill anybody, and it doesn't cause serious disease in humans. And so the idea was, hey, let's take the G protein, the envelope protein that interacts with the cell to initiate infection out of VSV and replace it with the Ebola virus glycoprotein. So that if this infected a human, um, then this Ebola virus um, glycoprotein um, could protect. It could elicit a protective immune response. And so this is replication competent. When it's injected into us, it replicates, but it doesn't cause disease. And um, there were um, phase one and phase two trials done, um, and um, they noted that there was a rapid immune response to the glycoprotein, and it, it didn't cause um, disease in people. And then um, during the epidemic, um, they did a phase three trial. Okay, so a phase three trial is designed to demonstrate efficacy, right? And they employed this ring vaccination that I talked about for smallpox um, in the 1970s. And so um, here is the concept again of ring vaccination. You have a primary infected individual, um, and then you take the people that, in, that have been exposed to that individual, those are the primary contacts, and then the people that have been exposed to those primary contacts as secondary contacts, and you immunize that whole group of people, okay? Just as we do, was done for smallpox, um, again, in the 1970s. And so um, here is a um, very simplified outline of the trial. And so they identified 446 confirmed cases of Ebola virus disease. Yeah. Um, so the, the glycoprotein is as conserved as anything in the virus. Everything um, has many different variants, okay? But um, if you take a viral population, yes, it's, it's, it's quite conserved and it doesn't change so it looks like something completely different. But there's many different um, variants, say with single amino acid changes that you would find. But the optimal version of the glycoprotein um, tends to pull the population back, you know, the one that allows it to spread mo most efficiently. So that's what keeps it from changing um, dramatically. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then um, in those confirmed cases, they were able to identify um, 99 um, clusters of people. So these are the contacts. And they randomized 96 of them. And they had 48 clusters. I don't know why this doesn't add up. But they, en they ended up with 48 clusters that were assigned to get immediate vaccination and 42 clusters that were assigned to get delayed vaccination. And you'll see um, how that plays out in just a moment. And so at the end of the day, um, they managed to vaccinate um, a bit more than 2,000 individuals um, immediately after they were identified as being contacts of somebody infected with Ebola. And about 1,500 people um, were vaccinated after a delay. And the delay was 21 days, three weeks. And so you give people one dose of this. And um, when they concluded that someone was infected with Ebola, um, they, they um, proved it by doing 
QRT-PCR, which we just talked about, which will identify the fact that Ebola virus RNA is there. And um, this is an amazing figure, in my opinion. And so this is um, the um, result of um, the clinical trial. And on day zero, you can see the green arrow here, um, the people who were immediately vaccinated when the trial started um, um, are shown. And then here are the group that was 21 days later that they were vaccinated. And um, so here we're looking at individuals with confirmed Ebola disease. So this was the percent of the whole population that they're graphing, and, and this is simply time. And if we look first at the blue line, okay, these were people who were immediately vaccinated. Um, what you can see is that they had a number of confirmed cases going out for the first nine or 10 days. And um, then there were no more cases of Ebola. So why did, why did you keep getting confirmed cases for the, for the next 10 days? Um, well, remember, we're immunizing, and so we're inducing an immune response. And so it takes one to two weeks um, to generate an effective immune response where your adaptive immunity um, is, is um, um, bringing lots to the party. And so in that first um, nine to 10 days, people weren't yet protected by the, by the vaccine. Okay. But now look at the people where the delay was for 21 days. Okay, so you can see people kept um, being infected with Ebola, having Ebola symptoms. Um, and then um, after the vaccination, there was another 10-day period or so where people um, still um, um, came down with Ebola disease, and then it stopped. Okay. So it looks like, from this data, that the vaccine is pretty much 100% effective. Okay. It really works, because if, once you've had the time for the vaccine to elicit a protective immune response, you get no more people um, showing disease. Um, I, I often talk about this experiment with um, students at Princeton, and somebody always raises their hands. Th these are people that include policy as, as well as scientists. Somebody always raises their hands and says, I think this delay um, in this arm of the trial was unethical, and you should have just been able to go from historical controls and vaccinate everybody. Um, but you have to think of the time when this was happening, because this was an issue that was very extensively discussed. And people decided, we don't know when this epidemic is going to burn out, and we have to know if we have an effective tool here for the next time this happens. And so it was, I think, with perhaps an overabundance of caution to set things up so that they could get the answer um, that um, they did this delay. And so some people gave their lives for that, but they proved that this really works. Okay, so we have a vaccine now. Why did they make the vaccine in one virus uh, packaged by another virus? And why not just emulate the virus or... Yeah, so... Um, one of the classical ways to make a vaccine that, that Arnie is referring to is um, you can attenuate it. So um, you can, as, as was done, for example, with polio virus. And what people did with polio virus um, to make the live viral vaccine was they took polio virus isolates, took them into the laboratory, and infected cells in the laboratory, um, got the virus to grow and produce progeny, took those progeny, used them to grow again in a second culture of cells, and did it again. And this is called serially passaging the virus. And when you do that in the laboratory, um, the goal is to attenuate the virus so that the virus um, can still grow in the laboratory, but it can't grow in us very effectively. And so that worked beautifully um, in the case of poliovirus. Um, you could, as Arnie suggested, um, do the same thing with Ebola, and you might succeed, although there's some spectacular examples where that doesn't work. And, it took a long time for people to figure out why, like in the case of cytomegalovirus. Um, but of course, it's very hard to work with Ebola. And this was a time-sensitive thing. And so one of the ideas that has been out there for a long time is to use other viruses 
as vectors for specific segments of the pathogen's genome that you want to protect against. And so VSV had been developed and studied quite extensively for its ability to do this in various animal models. And so um, this started with a biotech um, who um, picked this and focused on it and um, showed that um, in um, all the way up to monkeys they could get responses. And then um, Merck acquired the biotech and they took it then forward into the phase one and phase two trials and then sponsored the phase three trial. Yeah, that's, that's another approach. And um, so um, there's, there's a, a good number of vaccines now where you just administer the protein and not an infectious agent. And the FDA, of course, greatly prefers that because um, the, the, the quality control, while still must be maintained at a high level, there's not these dangerous d dangers associated with infectious agents. Um, and that is an approach that has been explored and there's, there's been studies done in animals. Um, there's effica efficacy um, been seen, um, but this was the one that was taken forward. But that's a, that's a good idea and it, it could well work just fine. You often think that if you take a virus that can replicate in us, um, it's going to be more efficacious at, re at developing um, an immune response both in terms of a a B cell response that makes antibodies and a cellular response that can kill um, infected cells. So the replicating virus, in my opinion, is probably the better bet, but not the safest bet. Right. So what happened with the viruses that got the, in the test system? Did, did they get bigger? Did they get um, I don't think that's known. I've never seen that discussed. And the reason being that um, it's only with this second pandemic, the second epidemic in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo that a good number of people are being vaccinated and they can be followed. And when, when this initial work was done, I was right at the end of the epidemic and they didn't have um, people who had been vaccinated to follow up. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Yeah. that if someone already has some immune memory against the, the, the other virus that is transferred through one, they won't develop anything? That's, 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 a, that's a very interesting um, issue that you bring up and, and it's very central to people how you think about this. First of all, most people haven't seen VSV, so that's one of the reasons it was chosen. Um, but if, if you recall, um, Merck used adenovirus as the backbone for an HIV uh, vaccine. And um, this vaccine was spectacularly unsuccessful. And um, one of the issues that people kept thinking about is that adenovirus infections are very common in people. And is that going to be an issue? And that was one of the goals of the trial to figure out whether there was an issue as to whether you had pre-existing immunity to adenovirus. But the whole trial failed so brilliantly that um, they never really got into that question. Yeah, but that's always an issue. Yeah. Can I ask you, like, back to like the trial? Like, I understand what you said about you know, the twenty-one days, etc. But when you have thought that after like you know, after fourteen days, you basically knew that the difference was real. I mean, there should have been like some threshold of like if it's very effective after this point, we should not keep delaying it. Yeah, um, <laughs> I I th I think you you could have. Um, that, that, that's sometimes called an adaptive trial design. And, and so the, the, the people running the trial um, have got the pre-agreement that if they see something like you just described, they can change and um, give everybody the efficacious treatment. But that wasn't done here. But you, you might have been able to shave a week off of it. I think you're right. OK, so what about Ebola then? and, and, um, and um, Tony Fauci's perpetual challenge. Well, we see a number of really um, central issues that Ebola has addressed. Huge issue number one, um, zoonoses. And so um, if you think about it, um, we know Ebola's out there. And we sure as hell hope it stays in bats. Um, but um, there's all kinds of stuff out there that we have no idea what it is. And so 
um, that brings a big question to the table. How do we start to better understand um, the immense biological diversity that's out there? Um, this shows you, the zoonosis shows you an example of interspecies transmission from bats to men. And we saw adapt adaptation and persistence, um, two things that viruses can do that um, can be very, very problematic. Um, huge issue number two, vaccines. We got lucky, okay? Um, this was a trial that was hurriedly put together, um, but it worked. And more generally, um, if you think about um, viruses and vaccines, um, the proper term is trials and tribulations because it ain't easy um, to come up with effective vaccines and they fail more often than they work. Huge issue number three, antiviral therapeutics. Um, we have nothing yet, okay? Nothing that's been tried um, looks terribly interesting. Um, there are um, two drugs that I know of that are going through um, FDA approval um, trying to meet the standards of the animal rule. And so the animal rule is a rule at the FDA. If, if you have a disease um, where it would be unethical to perform a clinical <coughs> trial, for example, you couldn't challenge somebody with the disease or you couldn't withhold the drug, um, then um, what you can do is first show that your candidate is safe in people, okay? And then you can show in two different animals that uh, everybody can agree are valid models for the human disease. You can show in those two different animals that you have efficacy, then you can get an approval, okay? And that's probably what's gonna happen, okay? And so um, that's Ebola. Now, I've run out of time, uh, right? You could take another five minutes. Okay, minutes. I'm gonna go to, go to one slide. So I'm gonna skip the whole part where I told you, beware of what I say. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, it's also the part that I know a lot about because it has to do with my virus. And um, I want to talk about this. Um, is there such a thing as a beneficial virus? A beneficial virus, a virus that when we're infected, we benefit from it. Well, here's a, um, a very intriguing experiment that was done some years ago, 2007, um, by a fellow um, named Skip Virgin. Um, um, out in St. Louis at Washington University. And um, Skip Virgin works with a virus, it's a herpes virus called Gamma HV68. And this is a human, this is a herpes virus um, that infects um, um, mice. And it's thought to be a reasonable model for how Epstein-Barr virus infects us. Okay, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything about Epstein-Barr virus. So this is a herpes virus. And one thing that this virus can do, which all herpes viruses can do, is that it can infect the mouse and then in a month or so, you find the mouse no longer has actively replicating virus, but it has latent virus, okay? The virus has entered latency um, and um, it enters latency um, in several different cell, lives, cell types, including um, macrophages and dendritic cells. Okay, so um, these are survival plots. Okay, so this is the, number, the percent of mice that have survived. And these are days after they've been challenged with a bacteria that normally would kill the mouse. Okay, it's a bacteria called Listeria. And if they first infect the mouse um, with gamma HV68 one week before they challenge with listeria, um, you can see whether you were infected or not, um, you're toast, okay? Listeria kills you, okay? So this is one week. There's no latent virus at this point. The virus is actively replicating, okay? Here's four weeks later. Now by four weeks, people who, know, who study this virus know that the virus has entered latency, okay? And now you do the same experiment, you challenge with listeria, okay? And you can see that the, the mock infected mice, the mice that didn't get the virus, they die. And the um, vi mice that got the virus survive, okay? Latent virus protecting against a bacterium. Um, here's 12 weeks later, 
And the, the effect is, is not as, as potent as before, but again, um, you're much more likely to survive if you have this latent virus present um, than if um, you have no latent virus. Then you can look um, directly at the production of listeria in the infected mice. So here's a mock infected mouse, and um, here is um, the quantification of, of listeria in the spleen, okay? Um, and then um, if you infect with um, gamma HV68, um, you see that it's statistically less, okay? O73 stop is a variant of the virus that can't become latent, okay? And so you don't protect, you don't prevent the growth of listeria in the spleen. MCMV is another herpes virus of mice. In fact, it's related to the virus I work on. And um, it um, also um, reduces the production of, of listeria in the spleen. If you've previously been infected with that. Simplex doesn't help. Synbus virus doesn't help. And of course, if you previously um, immunize with listeria, um, then you block it because you've induced an immune response and that's just like a vaccine would work. And you get a similar sort of story in the liver. And so um, he wrote this paper. Um, and then of course, the question that everybody asked, well, how does the latent virus protect um, against the bacterial infection? And um, the one clue that he had was that if he looked in these mice harboring the latent virus, um, there was chronic elevated levels of interferon gamma um, in the blood of these mice, okay? And so the latent virus was causing the secretion of interferon gamma. And one thing that inter interferon gamma does all sorts of stuff, but one thing that interferon gamma does is that it activates macrophages, okay? It activates ma macrophages. And that has two very broad general consequences. One is that the macrophages um, can phagocytose and destroy invading microbes. And the second thing that it can do is to prevent, present antigens from those microbes um, to the adaptive immune system to generate an immune response. And so um, this appears to be what's going on, but remarkably, nobody has ever come back to this. People have re repeated as result, but nobody's come back to this and tried to nail the mechanism. And I think it's just incredibly intriguing. Yes? Um, so it's, it's interesting. So you're asking, is, it, is, is the virus not just a parasite, but is it a symbiont? I think it's what, and that, but also I think the question of why is it an advantage to be latent? Why is that an advantage to the virus? Why would it evolve to do that? And that, through evolution then, could have encouraged us in our response to the virus and let it be there and let it be latent because it's an advantage. I, th I think that probably makes good sense. What I'm fixated on is understanding why it really works. Um, but I, I, th I think that you have to look, if you read this paper, you have to agree that it's an advantage to the mice to have the latent virus. So it, 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 there is an advantage. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it's coming from the infected cells. So it's interesting. So the uh, prime sources of interferon are T cells. And he used mutant mice to show that he got the same effect and the same elevated levels of interferon gamma in mice that didn't have T cells. So um, uh, macrophages themselves induce T cells, so that could be uh, interferon gamma. And so that could be where it's coming from. Are the viruses going into these macrophages? Yes. Yes. There's an advantage to the virus here that, that um, in the sense that it escapes the immune system during your whole lifetime. So the, what the virus is doing is really very interesting. First of all, it's going in the cell. <coughs> so antibodies can't get in the cell, so they can't neutralize it. Right? Secondly, it's, but 
not really even recognized by the uh, T cell adapter of the immune system, which might have recognized an infected cell. Right? So this virus latency is a really interesting thing because you you get your herpes viruses very early in life, and you carry them for life. So if it was varicella, you might get shingles to come out later on in life. Uh, if it's cytomegalovirus, it may come out later when you're older and things like that. But so this virus has found an evolutionary niche where it can hide from your immune system. So there's an advantage to the virus. Now what this shows is that the host has now suddenly taken advantage of the virus that has an evolutionary niche as well, and it becomes really symbiotic rather than that one, there's one winner and one loser. And you know what's interesting? Um, after that paper was published, there were a, a whole series of letters to the editor about it. Um, and of course, they came from all directions. But one that was intriguing was asking the question, when do we not want to develop a vaccine for a virus? If you cured every one of certain herpes viruses, what are the unintended consequences of that? And so that's, that's intriguing. And it's, it's an out. So um, this is the last slide, and I, I apologize for going over. But these are some questions then that derive from things I talked about today that, that intrigue me. And I know different things will intrigue you. Um, so the first is who's out there. I mean, I've brought this up before, but um, we're only scratching the surface in terms of understanding the incredible diversity of viruses um, here on Earth. and. Um, one of the things that makes hard knowing who's out there and, and, and what they might be doing is the fact that the vast majority of viruses that we've identified in these sequencing campaigns, um, nobody can grow them. Okay, so, so that's an issue. Um, what are the mechanisms that balance viral growth versus persistence versus latency? Um, as Arnie was saying, latency is so important. Um, to the, the, the growth of the virus, the life cycle of the virus. Um, latency is why um, we can't cure people of HIV. We can't cure people of, of, of herpes virus infections. Um, you saw that persistence is how cytomegalovirus manages to infect almost everybody who's alive um, because it, it has this persistent phase where it's in our saliva and our urine and breast milk. And um, so I, I think that we just don't understand these mechanisms beyond entry level understanding at this point. And we've got to know much more about them. Yeah, I mean, for the latency, so we don't know all mechanisms for, or how we know some, the mechanisms for some examples. Yeah. Um, all it's it's, it's, it's interesting. In, 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 um, in bacteriophage, I think we understand mechanisms pretty well. So I would agree with you. Um, but if, if we take the virus that I work on, cytomegalovirus, um, it's latent in, in what we call CD34 positive um, bone marrow stem cells. And um, it's really complicated because um, after working on it and developing systems um, for a number of years, um, we and other people identified four proteins that are abundantly expressed they're virus-coated proteins that are abundantly expressed. And now people have shown, well, you know, if, if I do um, deep sequencing, I can find a huge portion of the genome being expressed at a much lower level. And then people sequence individual cells and find that the level of viral expression is very different from cell to cell. And now we don't even know which examples of those cells are the true latent examples. So we, we just have so much we have to learn about what's going on. And for some years, I thought if, if we can understand how these four proteins work, we'll have a pretty good sense of how latency works. But it's probably nowhere near that simple. But yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's an issue that intrigues me. Um, how do viruses interact with the immune system? Um, my god, this is um, so interesting and so nuanced. And viruses interact at the cel cellular level. Um, these are intrinsic immune reactions at, in the local microenvironment and the systemic level. And as you could see with that example um, uh, uh, from um, the mouse herpes virus that we just talked about, um, there's a lot going on that we don't really understand yet. And then the last thing. How is it that the problem of being a successful virus has been solved in such remarkably different ways? 
Now, um, at one level, this is kind of a, a why is the sky blue kind of question, um, because we know that the problem of life has been solved in many different ways, and I, I think Clyde has probably talked about that very elegantly. Um, but you know, if you think about um, the hepatitis B virus, it's about um, 3,300 nucleotides base pair genome. It encodes four stinking proteins, and it's managed to infect about 350 million people. Okay, so it's very successful. Okay, um, my virus, cytomegalovirus, um, it encodes about 200 genes. Okay, and it infects almost everybody. It's very successful. Okay, but why did one virus have to be much so much more complex than another um, to to get itself out there and be a successful pathogen? Um, I think that's an intriguing question. And so I know you'll have a lot of questions to add to this, and some of them will be more interesting than what I've come up with. Yeah? Uh, so I was wondering, like, you know, I can understand why latency is like a lot more difficult to understand just by its very nature that it's like high. But at least for like the viruses, for like human viruses, have this like more little, it seems clear that there's anything that they have in common. It's like, you know, like some underlying like mechanism, maybe it's like, you know, HIV is there. So you've given me an opening that I'll respond with what I was going to talk about um, that I, I left out, and that is, you know, if, if you want to find a really interesting way um, to attack viruses, find some cellular process that A, many different viruses depend on it, and B, you can modulate it without causing toxicity in a, in a person. And that makes for a really exciting way to think about um, antiviral therapeutics because um, now you can have one molecule that instead of just um, being able to treat um, cytomegalovirus or just being able to treat HIV um, can treat a whole swath of different viruses. Okay, so they're broad spectrum. But the other thing, since you're messing with cellular processes, um, the virus theoretically is not going to be able to evolve resistance to that. And so, yeah, understanding these common processes, I think, is, is really important. And that's part of understanding how viruses leverage cellular um, proteins and products um, to, to be able to replicate themselves and how cellular products can antagonize viruses. Great question. That's really interesting. So um, I guess there could be upsides and downsides, right? Because if there's inter interdependencies in, and you um, disrupt a key node um, in these viral interdependencies, you could, you could hit a much broader group of viruses. Um, that, that's certainly um, possible, and it's not too hard to imagine that. And, um, and you could also then wonder, though, if, if you have a lot of um, viral bystanders, bystanders getting slaughtered at the same time as you're going after your target, um, could there be unintended consequences? And um, something we have to learn. Is there any evidence for, say, uh, a virus that has like, two different transport mechanisms or something that meets up and meets up with other? Is there sort of well, there's, there's viruses that can, en like the virus I work with, it can enter cells in completely different ways. Okay, different cells in different ways. And it can also spread um, to a limited extent by making a virus particle that leaves the infected cell and goes find a new cell, but mostly by uh, spreading directly to neighboring cells that are contacting the infected cell. So yeah, it can enter and spread in very different ways. And um, that's, that's not uncommon, many viruses do that. Yeah. 
So, um, so Kurt, I think that's a, a really interesting question. And um, first of all, we, we don't understand latency well enough, I think, for me to answer that in an authoritative fashion. But there's, of course, um, examples um, with HIV and with all of the herpes viruses um, where in the appropriate cellular environment, um, they're substantially um, um, silent. And then... So in the case of CMV, it's in the nucleus, but it's not integrated. Okay. But yes, um, latency, you... But the latency is... The reason you don't integrate is because you want it to come out too. I mean, so it has to go two ways. Right. Uh, latency is not only going in, it's coming out. And it comes out, in many cases, it comes out because of stress. So uh, Varicella is thought to be, uh, when you're under stress, that there is con. Psychological as well as... So hormonal changes, things like that, age-related changes. But then to your point, there, there are other viruses that can enter a cell and integrate and then just sit there. And adeno-associated virus is an example of that. And actually that characteristic of AAV um, is used um, to, to employ it as a gene therapy vector. Yeah. There's a virus that's viable by itself, but it's carrying along defective viruses with it by complementing it genetically. So they're, they're even parasites of viruses. <laughs> exactly. Hey, everybody, thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Thank you.